Thank you. Thanks for that spontaneous applause. <laughs> hey, this is great, though. Look at this crowd. Uh, hey, just a real quick show of hands. How many people are here? <laughs> All right, that's a lot. All right, who's not here? Oh, thanks for not coming. All right, great to see you guys. Thank you so much. Um, I have a limited amount of time and a lot to cover. I'm going to tell you up front what the class is about so you can decide if you're in the right room. Uh, so first, it's why I decided to do this class. So I, I'm the publisher of Photoshop User Magazine, and we have a review section in the magazine. And because of that, a lot of book publishers will send me books. They just send them and hope that we'll review them in the magazine, and we do. A lot of them get, get reviewed. But this one book comes in one day, and the book is on composition. Beautiful cover. I looked at it, and I'm like, ooh, this is good. I just took a quick flip through it. This is a killer photographer. I, whoever the guy wrote it was really, really good. He was great. I'm looking through his images and stuff. And so I finally got a chance to sit down with the book. And I open up, and first chapter, um, Rule of Thirds. And I'm like, Rule of Thirds. The next one was Leading Lines. The next one was Fill the Frame. And I'm like, after all these years, we're still using the same rules. If you went back and bought a book from the 1930s and looked at on composition, what do you think it would be? Let's go back further. The rule of thirds was first referred to in print by John Thomas Smith in 1797, 11 years before I was born. So, <laughs> So I call up a friend of mine, a buddy of mine who's a very serious photographer, and I call him up and said, hey, I just got this book of, uh, on composition. And I go, what do you think the first chapter is? And he goes, leading lines. I'm like, wrong, idiot. No, <laughs> he, guessed, he did, he guessed leading lines. But then I'm like, no, it was, it was rule of thirds. And he said, so was the next one leading lines? Yes. Was the next one fill the frame? Yes. It's like teaching composition hasn't changed basically since the 1700s. And here's a new book, and I'm like, I can't believe this new book is the same kind of stuff. So I, th I think it is they're leaving out a really critical part about composition that we don't ever talk about, and you're going to understand why in just a minute. And you're going to understand exactly why photographers don't like to talk about what our topic is today. Um, and, I, and I'm going to go into that in just a minute. But I, I want you to think about this, right? is how important is the composition part? I think it, it's, it's the critical piece of all this because, for example, um, I'm going to give you a, a, just a quick story. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, you know, we were doing these one-day seminars around the country, and we were doing great with them. We're getting 400, 500 people per day. And so I came up with the idea. Uh, I had been a professional full-time graphic designer for, for a number of years, and I came up with the idea to do a day that wasn't about Photoshop, and it wasn't about, well, there was only Photoshop. It wasn't about Photoshop, and it was going to be instead about design, like how to design. Now, back in those days, uh, and, oh, by the way, the tour was called Driven by Design. And so back in those days, the program that everybody used as their page layout and their design thing was a program called Aldis PageMaker. Adobe wound up buying them years later, but this was before people started using Quark Express and then before everybody switched to InDesign. That's how long ago it was. Well, the day was not going to teach PageMaker. Instead, it was going to teach typography and advertising design and how to lay out a publication or a newsletter. There was a whole class just on how to design an ad that gets results, uh, the design essentials, how to work with color. And so I walk in the room the first, very first day, and there's 40-something people in the room. And I'm like, uh-oh. I'd booked four cities for it, and there's nobody there. So at the end of the day, people were coming up and they're like, this is the best day of design ever. They're freaked out. They're like, this is incredible. They're just, the feedback was unbelievable. It was 47 of the happiest people in that city. So I, I asked them, I said, would you guys mind sticking around after my session? Because I just got to ask you guys something. So a lot of people stuck around. And I said, so why is there nobody here? And, and they were unanimous in saying, well, if you were teaching PageMaker, it would have been a packed house. But because you were teaching design, the thing they actually need, they didn't come. I went to the next series, the next city, 50 people, the next city, 60 people. It was like I couldn't wait to get that tour over. 
uh, because it was just, it was a great success from the teaching side and a miserable failure from the business side. But so I started calling some of my own friends in my area, the people that I knew should have been at that thing. And I said, why didn't you go to this design stay, day? And they said, I already know PageMaker. Learning the design, that was the important part of this. But they thought that learning PageMaker would be enough. And it's just like so many photographers today. I talked to so many people that say, you know, I, if I could just learn my camera, I could take really great photos. That's their page maker. They're thinking, if I can learn my camera, you know what, I know what they're looking for. They're looking for this screen right here. <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you, I've looked. It's not on my, it's not on my, it's not on my, <laughs> my camera. It's not on your camera. You know where it is, what's weird? It's on this camera. Anyway, <laughs> if I could just learn to make great photos, that's like an artist sitting there going, if I knew which one of these brushes would paint, I would be set, all right? So what's weird is, after all this, do you know what my number one most asked question is? When I do a full day seminar, I just did one in Orlando a week and a half ago. You know what the, most, the number one most asked question about is? About exposure. People come up, what exposure mode are you using? What if you do this? What about that? What if it's sunset? And they're asking these questions. I'm like, are you kidding me? So let's say that you're shooting and you look on the back of your camera and the photo's too dark. What could you possibly do? You could move one dial. <laughs> but, but what if you totally blew it? You totally blew it and you don't know that you underexposed. You're underexposed by a half a stop or a stop or whatever, and you get back to your computer, you open it up and like, oh no, it's underexposed. You could move one slider a sixteenth of an inch and it's fixed, but we're so obsessed with, I, I just think it's crazy. It's the number one most asked questions. Let me tell you something. Your phone is not gonna ring one day and it's gonna be a prospective client and they're gonna go, hi, I need to hire a photographer, but look, here's what I need. I need a photographer that will make a photo that's not too dark or it's not too bright. <laughs> it's never gonna happen, right? So what is the thing that is going to make this difference? What is it? It's composition. Composition is your thing. It is your, it is your secret sauce that's gonna get you through this and all of a sudden get you jobs. It won't be the brightness or the darkness of your photo. It'll be something else. And I wanna put this in perspective for you. So you've all seen, either in person or in pictures, um, the Eiffel Tower. It's so one of the most amazing structures ever made. It was built in 1889 uh, for the World's Fair. And when it was built, the French hated that structure. Do you know why? Because the French hate everything. But anyway, <laughs> it's considered by many people to be one of the most beautiful man-made things. I mean, it's from an from a, uh, engineering feat. It's amazing. It's inspiring to see it in person. The scale is incredible. And it's even romantic. It's, it's, you can use it as a romantic device. It's that great. But you're standing in front of this amazing structure. It's fantastic. You have your camera in your hand. And without good composition, you can take the most uninspiring photo ever. All right? So if you can stand in front of something that looks phenomenal and just blow it, right? If you were good at composition, could you take something average and make it great? Like, for example, could you take a guy down at the docks pulling a rope? Could you make that a great photo? Jay Maisel did. I have this one hanging. We have this hanging in our offices. And I look at this thing, and I can spend 20 minutes going why it's so amazing and why it's so great and how he chose not to have the worker's head in it and how the red socks play off the red hull and just all these amazing things. And it's like it really comes down to composition. But I want you to I want to frame this really quickly for you, because really, you could take all of photography and bring it down to two things, all right? The first one is this. It's what you're standing in front of. If you're standing in front of something amazing, it's not that hard to get a good picture if you just have the basics of photography. If you're standing here, right? So this is a wonderful uh, photo from my friend Karen Hutton. And, and Karen let me use this photo to show you you could actually train a monkey to run up the leg of your tripod and press that button, and this is the shot they would get. But what if you're not standing in front of that? What if you're standing in front of this? That's pretty much what you're gonna get, right? 
if you're standing in front of this, this is your scene. Or this, if you're standing in front of this, if you're shooting a wedding and this is the scene and this is the church, you're not going to get this. So that's one thing. It's what you're standing in front of. But then, and here's the big, here's the big thing that will save you. It's how you frame the shot. When you're standing in front of something awesome, now it's up to you to frame the shot. And this is the thing that they don't talk about, they don't teach, but I haven't gotten to the really bad part which is coming. Really, it's your composition. Because when you have something amazing and a great composition and they come together at the same time, it's flipping magic, it's just magic. And so I, I've been lucky enough to be a, a judge at a number of award shows all over the world over the year. Now today, most of my judging is done. I get an email link from the competition and it's done by myself in my room wearing a mask. Uh, <laughs> but for a lot of the time, I'm in a room with the judges. Like there's 10 or 12 of us. And it's so, it's one, I wish everybody could do this because it's so fascinating. You're sitting there and an image comes up on screen and we're all silent. Another image comes up and we're like, that's okay. Another image comes up and somebody will say, I kind of like that one. And then an image comes up, and the split second it comes up, the entire room at once goes, ooh. It's a split second. There's no time to analyze, is it technically correct? Did they crop it right? Was there something distracting in the photo? It has an emotional response. When those two things come together, something amazing, composed really well, it creates that magic and it gets that room to, to ooh. It literally is the composition. It comes down to that. It's what you leave in, and what you leave out. Now, that book I told you about, I'm, it, it has the rules, and it had, I don't know how many rules, there's, there's, depending on who you talk to, there's five rules, there's 10 rules, there's 20, just depends. I'm gonna go over the five, my five favorite, the most popular ones, I'm gonna go over in three minutes, so you don't have to buy the book. All right, first one is, I already mentioned it, the rule of thirds. If you're not familiar with it, here's, here it is in 30 seconds. So the rule of thirds has you basically deciding that, okay, you're gonna mentally divide your thing into thirds. You can even turn this on in some cameras, even in your phone, there's, you can put a rule of thirds grid. And where the things intersect, where those little dots are, that is where you're supposed to put something interesting. Right, you're not supposed to put stuff in the center because it's dead center is dead awful. All right, so here we have the guy in the center. It's like what your kid would take if you said take a picture of daddy. But to make this more dynamic, you just move them over to the left third, right? So he's right where those intersect, right? So that just makes the picture more, it's a very simple concept, I know, these are basics, right? And then, well, not, don't move the grid, let's move him, there we go. And let's say that he is uh, on this side now. And that makes it more dynamic because the middle is just kind of pretty boring. Um, so what if he's very short? Then you would put him here, or if he's very short, perhaps over there, but uh, that's probably not the best. Okay, we'll put him right here, all right. So that's, that's the basics of the rule of thirds. But what about the horizon line? Like, what's the deal on that? There's a special rule for it. And the rule that I go by is this. Look, you're gonna divide the image into thirds. If the sky's not happening, then you're gonna move the horizon line up to the top third because you're not gonna show too much of the sky. But if you have a really good shot, sky, if the sky's happening, right, you divide it into thirds and you're gonna put that horizon line in the lower third. That's pretty much it. So if you have a good sky, Basically, it's this, you hide the boring third. Like, like, for example, this image, there's no sky, it's just nothing, it was just kind of blue, so you hide it, all right? But if it's a really cool sky, you show a bunch of it. All right, number two is fill the frame. This is a really easy one. You take the shot, it's okay. Fill the frame is just means that you're gonna take your subject or whatever your subject is or whatever scene it is and try to fill the frame as much. It creates a tremendous difference in dynamicism, if that's even a word, but take a look. Same person taken seconds later, just filling the frame. Here they are side by side. Great quote by Robert Kappa, who said, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not standing close enough, all right? Here's another example, that's kinda, uh, Zoom up close, it brings the interest, it's more dynamic. Same thing here, if it's far away, it's kinda, uh, you move it closer, all right? The third of these is having a frame within the frame. So people love frames. What's the first thing they do when they buy a photo? They go to, to Walmart or Target and then realize that all the frame mats are made for film. And it's, don't get me started. Anyway, 
So it's putting a frame around your image. So you're shooting through a doorway, or you're shooting through a window or something like that. Those framey things, people love them. The response that people have to just doing something simple like shooting through a doorway, I don't know what it is. It's like shooting a lighthouse. It's immediately, it's just a get out of jail free card. But that's it, that's the third one, is just shooting through a frame of some kind. Number four, of course, is leading lines, right? You're going to use these lines to help draw the viewer into the photo, right? It just kind of creates a, a, a focal point for them. And like I was out on the ice here, looking for a crack in the ice, so one that would be aiming towards the mountain that I want to shoot, right? And they don't have to be straight lines. You can have curving lines to lead you down. There's a number of different ways to use leading lines, but that's the story, that's pretty much it. And here's just a couple more examples of it. And the fifth one I love, this one's one of my favorite, symmetry. So this is another compositional technique and it's everywhere, right? So what it basically is, it's people love it when the two sides of something match. They just love it. If everything is symmetrical, it, it really has like, and, and that's why everything is symmetrical. Look at this room. Right, look at the carpeting. Look just anywhere, look at the walls. They don't say, we'll make one kind of wide and then one not, and then one different size. Nope, they make everything symmetrical all the way around because it's pleasing to us, right? So when you have this symmetry, it just makes people happy. All right, now for example, it's not just like interiors and landscapes and stuff, it's also people. They've done studies that people with symmetrical faces that actually babies react stronger to people with very symmetrical faces, right? It's kind of weird, but it's true. All right, so that's the five rules of composition in three minutes. Now, here's the great thing. Once you understand these rules, now you can break them. Once you learn them, because there's two ways. You can say, I know what the rule is. Like, I know this person, not, person should not be in the center of this frame. I know that's the worst possible place, but this is where it works. I tried cropping this half a dozen ways. The only place where she looks good is right in the center. So I know what the rule is, but I'm breaking the rule intentionally. Not because I'm a goober, but because I know, all right, this is where it goes and I can break the rules. Now, I'm gonna give you just real quickly some of my other favorite ones that are not the basics, but this is a big one. I love negative space. That's where you leave a bunch of empty stuff so the eye is drawn directly towards what you want them to look at, right? Just there. Now, if I were standing here, this is in Iceland, and if I move my camera a little to the left, oh, there's the gas station, whoops. If I go a little to the right, there was a billboard from where I was shooting, right? You don't have to include those things, you can shoot exactly where you want it. So that's what these are. These are just examples of using negative space so the subject gets a, a bunch of uh, attention. Uh, using layers to add depth. Here's a shot I took, I think this is Tampa. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna create depth here. So depth is when you have a foreground object, you've got something a little further back in the middle ground, and you have background and then sky behind that. It creates depth, and when you wanna create one of those epic shots and you look at some shot and you go, wow, it's because they have depth. The other one is really simple. You have to have a clearly definable subject. Someone needs to look at your photo and go, oh. They don't need to look at their photo and go, oh, this is nice. Where am I supposed to look? What am I looking at? If they ask questions like that, you already know that the photo's failed, right? You need a clearly definable subject. But we're here to not talk about all that stuff. I wanna talk about the next level. Because this is interesting. And this, and this is where we get to the uncomfortable part that photographers don't wanna talk about. There is an angle where everything looks its best. Right? It could be a person, it can be a place, it could be a product, an object, whatever. But there is a certain angle that where everything look its, looks its best. You're standing there in front of that scene and your job is to find that angle. So how do you do that? How do you find that angle? I think that a lot of photographers in their mind believe that a, a pro photographer walks onto the scene, looks around, uh-huh, they take the shot, got it and they walk away. And they walk to the next scene and take one amazing shot and walk away. And they walk to another one and they maybe take two shots, but it was because the first one they were sneezed while they were taking it. So, and I think that a lot of people, because what, what we see online is just that great shot, right? But the secret is working the scene. It is what you do that actually has you 
and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain this whole concept in great detail. Um, but to explain this concept, I'm gonna have to do something that I do not see photographers doing. And I understand why, and we're gonna experience this together. I'm gonna do this for you, and I'm gonna put myself out there, but I need you to do something for me. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. <laughs> I promise not to think less of Scott as a photographer after I see a bunch of the crappy shots he shoots. Because I'm gonna take you through an actual raw take of the images no photographer is stupid enough to do this, but this is the only way I can convey this point of working the scene, how important it is. So the, uh, we're gonna look at some photos in, in Lightroom uh, from a shoot I did in, in Tuscany, and it should be awesome. Uh, we're at a, a church with no roof, and it's out in the middle of nowhere, and I hired a violinist from Brazil who is a fashion model and, Brazil, and, and violinist, amazing violinist, and you think it would be like, oh, it's so easy to get a great shot. You have a Brazilian model who's a violinist in this cool, you will see that it is not as easy as it sounds. Here, let's take a look. And uh, here, these are some of the images here. And as you can see, I'm, I'm just, I'm killing it. Uh, let's, let's just go through real quick. Let's kind of go through this, this, the wonder and beauty of this shoot. Um, and we'll just, uh, we'll start up here. Here we go. And I'm just gonna kinda, like, yeah, bad. Oh. Maybe I should zoom out. No, no, how about no? Let's go, uh, all right, there, no. Oh, that ain't nice light on her face. Oh, out of focus, that's an interesting choice. Um, look at her hand is all lit, and, she, and now, it's, now it's just, oh good, her fingers like party. Um, that's better. This is getting, oh, I like that, that's okay. That's not bad. All right, flagging that one as a pick. This is, so that's good. That's maybe even better. All right, and that's back to bad. And bad, and let's see, stupid. Very nice, like signs behind her, good, good call. And bad, bad light, oh, perfect. Um, yeah, it's a lot of bad shots as I'm working the scene. I have a, a great location and a great subject and out of focus, nice, really good. Oh, fingers off the, okay, oh good, just, no, no, it's just a disembodied hand. Uh, and, oh, out of focus again, nice. oh, another out of focus, good, good job. And that stuff sticking in from the sides there, yeah, it's just, it's, it's all bad. Oh. So, as you might guess, I'm not going to show all those pictures online that are terrible, right? What am I gonna show? I'm gonna to go to one of the best ones, one of these ones back here, probably that one right there. I'm gonna take that into Lightroom and Photoshop and I'm gonna finish it. I'm only gonna show one single photo. You only need one, but you have to work that scene. You don't walk up and take one shot. I'm, I'm moving to the left, I'm moving to the right, I'm zooming in, I'm zooming out, I'm trying different angles, I'm trying different lighting, I'm going through a whole series of stuff because you know what? There's one angle that looks good and I don't know what it is yet. That's what we have to do, that is our job, is to find out what is that angle that all of a sudden looks amazing and our subject looks great and everything looks great. Now, there is post-processing done to that, but it's not as much as you think, except for there's one little cool trick. So I'll go ahead and show you the post just because we can. All right, first off, uh, I have to compose it a little better than I did. All right, just a little bit of a crop probably wouldn't hurt. All right, then we're going to fix the white balance. So my white balance was not good for her shooting in the shade with her back to the sun. And I'll, uh, let's see. It's hazy, so I'm gonna increase the dehaze amount, right? That's the best name slider. And maybe make the exposure a little brighter. The contrast, there we go. Crank up the contrast, a little bit of exposure. All right, that's really not too bad. But I need to go in here and brighten her skin. I'm gonna use the masking tool. And when you click on her icon, right, you can say I just want her facial skin. And I just want down here, those things that are turning red, I can mask those. I just hit this button down here called Create Mask. Now her face and her body are masked. So if I go and move anything here, like if I open up the shadows, 
just didn't do that much, and maybe increase the uh, exposure a bit, it brightens her skin. All right? So that's not bad, but I need to do one more thing that I might have, should have done in camera. I'm going to increase the whites a little bit. I'm going to take this over to Photoshop and do one thing, and it's called cheating. No, it's, it, we're going to use these weird filters called the neural filters, right? And uh, when you first use them, you have to download some of them because Adobe thinks these might be too weird for you. You might want to download them all. The one I'm going to do, and it's a beta, it's called Depth Blur. This thing is actually really good. You turn it on, and it creates a realistic blur like a shallow depth of field behind your subject. Now, it processes it just on your computer. It takes a minute. I'm going to increase the amount. And you're not done. It's not done until you see the, the little button called OK at the bottom right corner, the little button right here. When that turns blue, then it's done. And I'm going to increase. Here, well, here's a before and after already. Look, before and after. It's subtle, and that's why I want to do more. You have to wait until the little OK sign shows up. But it senses where your subject is. And it also blurs right in front of your subject. And then behind it, it graduates it. So it looks realistic. Because putting a Gaussian blur behind somebody looks stupid. Give it a second here. There we go. And look at the before and after now. So watch. Before and after. It's like you bought a better lens. So you bought a faster lens. All right? So that's the idea. That's it. That's how we got to, to our final image. All right. Let the embarrassment continue. <laughs> Let's look at another shoot where I'm not very good. All right, we're in Florence, and it should be easy because Florence is beautiful. I'm shooting from Michelangelo Park, which is just packed, packed, packed with American students. And, uh, and I was able to get my tripod right up to the window, which makes it wonder, Scott, if you had a tripod, why was your photo out of focus? I got to stop drinking before these shoots. Anyway, <laughs> so... I'm moving through. Oh, you look at this good stuff. This is quality. This is good. Oh, okay. I, I started to realize maybe it was too dark. Oh, and the out of focus thing's back. And I'm trying again and again. Let's zoom in a little. Let's zoom out. And I'm doing all the things you're supposed to do. I'm working the scene. I'm trying different brightness. I'm trying zooming. I'm moving. I can't move too far because you're kind of wedged in there. I did a pano. And then uh, that's, that's stupid. Okay. Oh, I kind of like that. That's not bad. And uh, let's see. All right. Yeah, this is, this is not my best work. All right. Now, how many of these am I going to show to the public? I'm going to fix one of them. I'm going to finish one of them, and that's going to be it. I'm going to do this one. You only need one, right? You only need one shot. You're not going to go, here's 35 shots of the same Duomo, right? Uh, here's the post-processing in case you care. Uh, let's go to the develop module here. And uh, I'm just going to first kind of hit the auto button to straighten it. It was a little crooked. And then, really, it comes down to I'm going to add, uh, I'm going to switch my profile to landscape so the colors look a little better. I'm going to make it bluer. And then I'm going to use the masking to do one other cool thing. I'm going to use the masking button. I'm going to hit Select Subject. So it selects the Duomo. But as you can see, it didn't select all of it. It's not a problem. We're going to take the temperature way over to yellow to make it the Duomo warm. And then I need to add to this. We'll make it a little brighter. I need to add to it, so I'm going to hit the Add button. I'm going to get a brush. And when I paint with this brush, it'll paint with the same settings. And that's how we got there. And maybe over here a little too. And that's how we got to the shot. Really didn't have to do very much. It's got to start with a decent shot. So, But when you go... Keep in mind, I only need one shot, but I got to work to get to that one shot. And so from where I was, I could really only get one shot, but actually I made two. I, uh, I grabbed this one too. All right, so what's a good way to get to the one? What happens when you're looking at a bunch of photos that are very, very similar, right? And you're like, well, how do, it's so hard to pick the best one. Here's what I do. This is a really handy trick for Lightroom Classic users. Um, so take a look at these images. I'm going to select a whole bunch of them that look very much the same. I'm going to press the letter N, which is Adobe's shortcut for survey mode. Makes perfect sense. Um, it puts all the images on screen. I don't have to pick the best one. That's too hard. I have to pick the one I like the least. You move your cursor over it, a little X shows up, and it leaves the screen. It doesn't delete it. It just removes it from the screen. So now I'm just going to figure out which one I like least. 
move my cursor over it and just have about this one up here. Nope, I don't like that. And it rewards you by making the pictures bigger as you go. So now that's got to go. Her eyes are closed. This one, she's got a headache. Uh, let's see, we've got a couple other headache shots. Uh, let's see what else. How about this one up top? No, that's got to go. That one's got to go. Let's see what else. And you're just trying to figure out which one do I not like and just keep going. See what made them bigger too? It rewards you. Uh, that one, we're, I don't, don't like the, ha the hands on that one. No, we're getting close. We're down to the final four. Uh, that one's got to go. All right, it's one of these three. Is it the bottom one? No, it is not. It's one of these two, and I, I, I just like her hands better on that. That's it. It's just an easy way for you to get to the, and then that's the one that you would, would work on. And by the way, in case you were wondering, because this may be a concern of yours, Scott, was she naked? I get, here's a behind the scenes photo so you can see clearly she's dressed. I was fully nude. However, <laughs> she, she was not. All right, so you gotta consider this next part, all right? Okay, so we know we're gonna, we're gonna work the scene and stuff, but if you stop at a scene, something drew you there. Like something said, hey, stop here, there's something. You may not know what that is, but that's your job is to find it. If something stopped you, there's probably something there, right? This is a beautiful scene. Something stopped me there. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> this, where was it? Right there. Something stopped me here. What was it? That, was that my first shot? That was my 45th shot. I walked around from every angle, shot it from every angle, all that stuff. And here's an important thing to do. When you're going, like while you're working the scene and you're shooting all these things, stop and pause for a second and look at your camera and see, is this going good? Is this going right? Because the last thing you want to do is get home and go, oh man, I should have shot this wide. I should have zoomed in. And you, because then it's too late. So stop right there. But one of the big things that you can do is to change your perspective. Just changing your perspective. Think of it this way. The whole world shoots photos like this, standing up at eye level. When you get down low, all of a sudden it's a much more interesting picture. If you climb up a story and shoot down, all of a sudden it's so much better. Change your perspective and it makes a huge, huge difference. Great quote from this guy, he did pretty well. A good photograph is knowing where to stand, right? So I'll give you a quick example, another embarrassing example real quickly of, so, we're gonna take go through the shoot, and you're gonna see me zoom in, zoom out. You're gonna see me shoot from a little bit down low on my knees, and then laying down on the floor of the studio, because I don't know which one of these. And you can see I'm, I'm doing a varying jobs of not good. And then I'm thinking, no, oh, double the amputee effect, nice. Good, good cropping, very bad. Um, and then, okay, this is better. Look where the top of the roll of the seamless is. And you can see when I get down low, there we go. This is me lying down now, right, to shoot a full length so the perspective is correct. And I'm just going through here trying to find what's going to be the shot. Oh, I think that might have been it. All right, and, you're, and then I'm back to zooming in. I'm zooming in, I'm zooming out, I'm changing the perspective. And, I'm, and when you change those things, it makes all the difference in the world. All the shots are, it's the same subject in the same lighting in the same outfit and everything's the same, but you're getting so many different shots to choose from until you find the one that you want and you're gonna work that. Now, so you know to work the scene, you know to zoom in and zoom out and stuff, but you can also work the settings. What if this shot would look better when you're changing the, the white balance, right? Now, I know what you're thinking. Scott, I can change the white balance later in Lightroom or Camera Raw. Yes, you can. But if you get the white balance looking right and the photo looks good, it inspires you. Do you ever get inspired by looking at your camera and go, this looks terrible, but I know I can fix it later? That doesn't inspire you. Having it look really good, you're like, ooh, this looks good, this looks good. So changing your f-stop, would it look better with the background out of focus or in focus, right? Would it look better if I shot this with a wider lens or maybe a taller lens? These are all part, you work in the scene and now you're working the settings, right? And you can also work the styles. Would this look better as a pano? Would it look better as an HDR or bracketing or a triptych? Would it work better to those? When you get to that point where you're like, okay, it's coming together, then you're gonna to go to stage three. Then you're gonna work the sharpness. Now the sharpness really matters. Do the first two stages without using your tripod. 
Walk around, because you know what I've learned from doing workshops? If somebody sets their tripod down, it's like it sinks down into cement. It's not moving. So if they just kind of set it down while they're walking around, they're like, well, there it is. Don't set it down until you found that spot. Don't set it down yet. By the way, I'm gonna give you a tip that has nothing to do with composition, but when I teach like Photoshop and stuff, I'm, I started teaching this. Um, I used to teach how to sharpen in Photoshop, and I don't anymore, because I don't sharpen in Photoshop anymore at all, period. Not in Lightroom, not in Photoshop. I cheat. I use one of two plugins. This thing called Topaz Sharpen, and by the way, if you mention my name, they don't care or don't know me. I don't have an affiliate link. I'm not trying to push anything on you, but I don't think it's fair that secretly when you're not looking, I'm using a plugin, but I don't tell anybody. Nope, this is exactly what I use. Look, look at the difference on screen. It uses AI, it looks at your image, and goes, this is what it needs, and you just click OK. Right? Here I'm walking around, hand holding a shot in low light. Same thing here, down in Miami. Look at the difference, look at the plate. So it's called Sharpen AI. You can go download, I think, a 14 day free trial. Or, I know a lot of you use On One's No Noise. It actually has, not only does it have no noise in it, but I don't know why, they snuck in a sharpening thing that is phenomenal. So either one of those, you probably own one of those or both of those. I'm telling you, that's the future, is having it analyze your photo instead of you having to be a mathematician. All right, the next thing, and this is huge. This was a changing point for me in my career. And somebody else pointed this out to me, and it's this. I spent so much of my career looking through my viewfinder and being disappointed and saying, this doesn't look good. What can I add to this scene to make it better? When the secret was, what can I take away to simplify the shot. And a friend of mine was talking to me about this and he goes, go look at your favorite photographers. Go look at their work. Find out what they're doing and look at their photos. The photos that you love of theirs, are they complex and there's a ton of stuff going on or are they very simple? I'm telling you guys, simplicity in composition is one of the, the big secrets. And you're in charge of what goes in the frame. You get to choose it. You're standing there. It's not, I can tell you the answer is generally not adding more. It's just doing as little as possible and cleaning it up, just looking at, is there anything in this thing that's gonna mess up the shot? Is there something sticking in from the corners? Is it just too busy of a scene? What can I do to just make this simpler and better? So that's it. That was a turning point for me when I realized the secret isn't what can I add, it's what can I take away? How can I simplify this scene? Like, who's this guy? Um, all that stuff, so less is more, all right? Let me just get through these, okay? And there's a great quote. This is a wonderful quote. And what he's essentially saying here is really, really good. And he's had a pretty decent career. Um, so he said this, if something in your photo isn't helping it, it's probably hurting it. If there's something in your photo and you left it there, it's probably, it's probably hurting, it's not helping. All right, you know what else? Think about this. Do you know why we do a shadow depth, depth of field, why we love it so much? Because a shallow depth of field separates our subject from the background, yes, right? But you know what else it does? It simplifies the scene. Look at the background behind her or behind him. I got a row of helicopters. By blurring and using a very, very shallow depth of field, all of a sudden the background becomes inconsequential. It focuses on your subject. All of that stuff makes a big difference. All right, just a couple more tips here before we wrap up. Uh, just to help you to take better pictures. And one of them, this has been really great for me, is becoming a photography detective. All right, and I'm gonna use, I'm gonna go to, to school on, on, on one of my heroes of photography, Joe McNally. The guy, there's something weird about him. He's like a magical unicorn of photography. Joe could take like a coconut and some wire and take a picture that would win an award. It's, it's sick. And so, and I stopped comparing anything to Joe McNally the way we should have never gone to the moon, right? Because now we go to the moon and you're trying to get your key to work on your door. We can send man to the moon and I can't get my door to open, right? Joe McNally's the same way. Joe just, he's just, I don't know how to explain it, but he really makes me angry. Anyway, <laughs> but this is one of my, now Joe's got phenomenal shots and I don't know why I'm so drawn to this shot, but I am. This is this fireman he took as part of his series uh, on the faces of 9-11. He did this whole thing on the first responders, which is brilliant. It's done museum shows and all this kind of stuff. But, but I look at this shot, and, and so here's why this is important to look at other people's photos. 
So if you love this shot, if you're like a fan of Joe's like I am, and you go, wow, I really love that shot, all right? And so take a piece of paper and pencil, go old school, and just write down what you love about the shot. Just detective it out, okay? Well, he um, uh, looks like a flash uh, lighting him, just one flash, and looks like there's maybe another flash behind him, maybe with a gel. He's on location, looks like a fire truck behind him. Um, it's kind of, the whole shot has kind of a gritty look to it. It's, he's shooting wide. It's got a really shallow depth of field and all. All right, so write all that down. Then go look at your photos. Maybe the reason why you're not happy with your photography is the photos that you love are entirely different than what you're shooting. Maybe you're shooting tall. Maybe you're using a real uh, uh, a depth of field that's really deep. Maybe you're using four flashes. Maybe what you love is this, but you're shooting something completely different. By looking at other people's photos, it can really help you. The next thing is, and, and hats off to Joe for letting me use this photo. Uh, the other thing is, Becoming a really good photo editor of your own work. I don't mean editing in Photoshop and Lightroom. And I'll give you an example. I was teaching at the Santa Fe workshops a number of years ago, and one night when you're teaching there, you have to take your students to a theater in town and everybody does a presentation. Each teacher gets up and does a presentation. And so I'm sitting in the audience with my students, and this guy gets up and he starts his slideshow, killer shot, and another killer shot, and then a pretty good shot, and then a good shot, then a shot, we all kind of looked at each other like, what's that doing in there? Then another kind of eh shot, and then a really good shot. And then another kind of eh, another one that was, was good. Then another killer shot. It went like that for two hours. So another guy got up after him, showed only a handful of shots. Every shot was amazing. So the next morning in class, I, I said, hey, before we start working in the class, let me ask you guys, and I asked my students, uh, what would you think of that second guy last night? And they were like, oh, he's amazing. Oh, they were just falling over each other. And I said, okay, what would you think of the first photographer? Dead silence. Nobody in the room said a word. I said, come on, he, was, he had some really great shots. And the first comment was, he had a lot of crappy shots too. So the problem was, he was showing you his best shots. He was showing you his second best shots, his third best shots, and his fourth best shots. If he had just shown you his best shots, everybody would have thought he was killer. I made two one minute and 16 second slideshows for you, right? I just grabbed some travel images of mine, I threw them into a slideshow. And, and you ha it's, it's the second one that's important, so, but you have to watch the first one. Here we go. There's audio to this too. Okay, same slideshow again, but instead I'm going to add some of my second and third best and fourth best photos into the same slideshow. Same thing, same song. That shot's bad.
The second rate shots and the third rate shots and the fourth rate shots are polluting that whole thing. So go look at your portfolio, right? Bring up your portfolio. People send me links to their portfolios all the time. And you know what they'll send me? 80 shots. And so I start going through them and I'm like looking, what do you think they put on their first page of their portfolio? Their best shots. What do you think's on second page? Their second best. What do you think's on their fourth page, right? So that's the thing. As you go further and further down on this, their photos keep getting worse and worse. So on page one, you're thinking, hey, they're really good. On page two, you're like, they're pretty good. On page three, you're like, uh-oh. On page four, it's like, whoops. <laughs> so think about that with your own portfolio, right? Do you need 80 images in there? Do you need 60? So how much better would people think about you as a photographer if you took out the last 20 and you only had 60? They'd think you're better. What if you took away your third best photos? You're that much better. What if you only showed your best photos? It makes a huge, huge difference. So that is part of the art of being a photographer, being able to pick your best images and only show those. But I, I, I want to talk about something that is, is a very controversial topic. We're going to end with this. But it is something that it has to be talked about. And it's the truth about the quality of your subject. This is the lighthouse in Sanibel Island. It has been called literally the ugliest lighthouse in America. It's just nasty. And I've seen some shots of it that are better where somebody found a better angle of the ugliest lighthouse in America. But uh, no matter what you do, it's not going to look like this one up at the Cape Netic Lighthouse up in Maine, right? So I don't know if buying a better lens will make that lighthouse better. I don't know which lens would do that except for the one on that Leica. Anyway, <laughs> but I want you to stick with me because the quality of your subject is going to really determine the quality of your photography. You've got to have a great subject and then you have to apply these things. So take a look, for example, this is a cheeseburger, all right? And uh, it's got a meat patty, it's got cheese, lettuce, tomato, and a sesame seed bun. Here's another cheeseburger, the exact same ingredients. Meat patty, cheese, lettuce, same lighting, same everything. Here they are side by side. Which one of these photographers would you hire? You need to hire a food photographer. They both can light the same, probably using the same kind of lenses and everything else. All right, so let me ask you a question. I want you to be honest when you answer this. What f-stop would make the, camera, the burger on the left look like the one on the right? <laughs> I know, trick question. It's ISO, isn't it? <laughs> Which ISO would make the burger on the left look like the one on the right? It's, it's not the fault of the photographer. Like, like, so which one's better? You're going to hire the one that has the great looking burger even though they really had nothing to do with the burger itself. Which one would you hire? I would hire the one that shot the great burger just based on the quality of their subject. Now, this doesn't hold just true to burgers. It also works for pizza. No, I'm just kidding. So, it also works for people. So I, I did a side-by-side -side example. So I just I shot this years ago. There's this uh, subject, uh, backgrounds out of focus, natural daylight kind of shot. And so I took the shot, and I'm not going to change any settings or any gear whatsoever, but I asked my assistant to step in instead. So I took the shot, and I said, all right, you step out, you step in, and, and here's that shot. <laughs> and I know you think, Scott, that's an unfair comparison. She had long blonde hair. Trust me, it ain't the hair. <laughs> So here's the thing, there's no f-stop, there's no ISO, there's no setting that turns Melvin into Dylan. <laughs> so I, I was showing somebody this one time and, and the guy wrote me a note, one of the guys in the audience wrote me a note and here's what he said, how about showing how you would shoot not attractive people? And then he said something I just thought was kind of mean, you know, the above average number of people getting married. Hey. They're getting married, there's something there. Anyway, shooting pe pretty people is easier. Actually, it's the same technique, it's just the results are that much better. But I don't want you to leave here saying, I went to Scott's Crush the Composition, and the final message was, you have to shoot beautiful people. You do not have to shoot beautiful people. You know what photographs amazingly well? Interesting people. People that are interesting make very, very interesting photos. So don't think it's just beautiful people. So, but what you're standing in front of 
and then how you frame the shots when you're standing in front of someone interesting or an interesting place or any of that makes all the difference in the world. Now, a friend of mine worked for Kraft Foods as their lead photographer, and he, he told me something that I'm gonna share with you that I thought was pretty interesting. Have you ever looked at the, the box of Kraft macaroni and cheese, which may be the single greatest product ever created? <laughs> Did you notice that, you know the little eyes at the end of the macaroni? You don't see one. Not a single eye in any craft box ever, because they pay a professional food stylist to take a pair of tweezers and turn every single noodle away from the viewer so it looks better. How it looks matters. All right, in the eight seconds we have left, <laughs> six, five. All right, I just want to recap, encapsulate this really quickly, just these last seven things. It will take approximately a minute and 14 seconds. Understand that a lot of your shots will be meh. You don't ever feel bad when you're looking at your take and feel like I'm not very good. You're only seeing every other photographer's best shot. They don't go on Instagram and go, this kind of sucks, right? No, they pick the best shot and that's the only one you see. And so we get this feeling that everybody else has just taken these great shots and ours are all crappy. But here's the thing, you're gonna take a lot of shots that are meh, but you only need that one. You need one good shot from that scene. Number two, when you're in front of that scene, you're gonna work it. You're gonna try all these different angles. You're gonna work the settings too. You're gonna work the settings and see, would this be better with a different white balance or a different lens or whatever. Then when all that comes together, now it's time to make sure the shot is deadly sharp and you also know how to sharpen it afterwards. But if you stopped at a particular scene because you thought there's something there, there probably is, and that is your cue to work the scene. Number six is show only your very best shots. Show your best stuff. Don't show the work that's half. Don't show your second best shots, your third best shots. Only show your best stuff. And lastly, if you stand in front of more awesome things, your chances of making an awesome shot go better. But when you realize you're standing in front of something awesome, now it's time for the second part of photography, which is to apply those composition techniques that hopefully that you just learned today. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>